Find the x-intercepts of the graph of the function without graphing the function. We have the function f of x equals square root of x plus 39 minus square root of x minus 3. And I know that when we're finding x-intercepts, we're going to let y equal 0. We don't have y in our equation, but we do have f of x, and that has the same meaning as y. So we're going to let f of x equal 0. And that'll give me the equation 0 equals the square root of x plus 39 minus the square root of x minus 3. And this question involves radicals. So this equation has radicals in it. In order for me to solve it, I need to get rid of the radicals in the equation. So the way that you get rid of the radicals is you isolate a radical, and then you're going to do the opposite of that operation to get rid of it. So this radical is a square root, and we will square both sides to get rid of it. But first, you have to isolate. So I'm going to add square root of x and add 3 on both sides. That gives square root of x plus 3 equals square root of x plus 39. So on the right-hand side, this radical is now isolated, and I'm going to be able to get rid of that radical by squaring both sides. I'm going to square on the left and square on the right. So on the right, you can see that there are no operations between the square and the square root. So they're right next to each other. They cancel each other out. And on the right, you get x plus 39. However, on the left, there, there is an operation between the square root and a square. So I can't just cancel them out. I actually have to multiply out um, what's there. So I'm going to write this uh, square by multiplying this twice. Let me fix that so it's not so messy. And then we'll multiply those parentheses out. So I'll continue up here. So when I multiply, I'm going to multiply the first two together. That's square root of x times square root of x. Then I'll multiply the outside two together. And that is going to be a positive 3 times square root of x. And then I'll multiply the inside two together. And that's a 3 square root of x. And the last two together, 3 times 3. So that's on the left-hand side of the equation. On the right-hand side of the equation, I have x plus 39. I'm going to sim simplify the left-hand side, square root of x times square root of x. When you multiply radicals together, you multiply what's underneath, so that's square root of x squared. And then over here, I have square, 3 square root of x and 3 square root of x. Those are called like radicals, very similar to like terms. So when you have like radicals, you can add them together, um, and this would be 3 plus 3, which is 6 square root of x. And 3 times 3 is 9. The square root and the square cancel each other out. And we have an x. Square root of x squared is x. So we made headway here. Um, initially, we had one excuse me, two radicals in the equation. And now we were able to isolate and get rid of one of them. But we still have another radical in the equation. So we have to repeat that process over again. We have to isolate that second radical and then square both sides to get rid of it. So I'm going to isolate this radical here. 
by subtracting x on both sides and also subtracting 9 on both sides. That leaves me with 6 square root of x on the left and a 30 on the right. I still want to isolate that radical by dividing by 6. 6 square root of x is 6 times square root of x. So to get rid of that 6, we divide. And then we have square root of x equals 5. And now we can get rid of that radical by squaring both sides. So square root of x squared will be x, and 5 squared is 25. And so we think that the x-intercept is 25, but with radical equations, we have to be a little bit careful because the way that we solved it leads to invalid solutions sometimes. So what I'm talking about is this step here when we squared both sides. When you square both sides, it can lead to solutions that don't work in the original equation. So anytime you use that method of squaring both sides, you have to check your work to make sure that the answer that you got works in the original equation. So I'm going to take this equation here, which is the original equation, and I'm going to substitute the 25 into the x's to make sure that we have a valid solution. So that gives 0 equals square root of 25 minus 39. I'm oh, sorry, that's a plus 39. Minus square root of 25 minus 3. So 25 plus 39, that's, let's see, 64. So we have square root of 64. Square root of 25 is 5. And square root of 64 is 8. Negative 5 and negative 3 combine to be negative 8. And you can see we do have a true statement here because 8 minus 8 is 0. So 25 is a valid solution to the equation, and 25, 0 will be the x-intercept. Now I want to comment on one question that came up um, earlier, because uh, my math lab uses a little bit different method for simplifying this part of the equation. So my math lab uses a formula on this part, and I'm going to show you that formula. And you'll notice I didn't use it in my solving of this. So the formula that my math lab uses is this one here. a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So that is a formula that is definitely true. I don't really feel the need to use it because as long as I know that a plus b squared is equal to a plus b times a plus b, I can always get to that formula. So when I multiply this out, I would get a times a, which is a squared, a times b, which is ab, then b times a, which is ab, and b times b, which is b squared. And when you combine those terms in the middle, that gets you to the formula. So that's why I didn't use the formula in my explanation. I just multiplied it out. But if you did want to use it on this problem, so we've got square root of x plus 3 squared. And using the formula, I would want to take my a and square it. So square root of x squared. And then I want to do 2 times ab. So this is b. I'm going to do 2 times a times b, 
and then do b squared. So remember this 3 is my b, so that's the 9. Oops, sorry. Let me go slower. b squared. And you get square root of x squared, which is x. 2 times 3 is 6. And 3 squared is 9. And I'm going to zoom out and show you right here the line where we got that. We got x plus 6 squared of x plus 9. Just doing a different method than what my math lab used. Determine whether the function is even, odd, or neither. Sorry, we can't see that, can we? Determine whether the function is even, odd, or neither even nor odd. And we're given this picture of a graph. Um, so on the right here, I have the definition of an even function and the definition of an odd function. Um, a function is even if for every x in the domain, f of x is equal to negative f of x. So this is a symbolic way of saying the definition, but our question involves a graph. So we're going to move on to the second part of the definition. The graph of an even function is symmetric about the y-axis. So that's what we're going to use to determine whether this particular function is an even function. And then we have something similar in our definition of an odd function. A function f is odd if for every x in the domain, negative f of x is equal to f of negative x. And we're going to use this portion, which involves the graph. The graph of an odd function is symmetric about the origin. So that's what we have to pay attention to. Is this particular graph? symmetric about the y-axis, or is this graph symmetric about the origin? And then we'll be able to say that it's either even or odd, and if it doesn't fit into those categories, then we say neither. So being symmetric about the y-axis, our y-axis is this vertical axis here, and being symmetric means that there would be like a mirror image over the y-axis. And we can see that on this particular picture that if we were to mirror over the y-axis, the mirror would look something like this. And that doesn't match up with any portion of the graph. So we can very clearly say that it is not even because we don't see that y-axis symmetry. So then we want to know if it has symmetry about the origin. Now the origin is this point here where the x-axis and y-axis cross each other. Um, that is the origin and that is the ordered pair 0, 0. So, in order to have origin symmetry, you would have a mirror image over the origin. And sometimes people have a little bit of trouble visualizing this. So, I like to think of it as two mirrors. You can mirror once over the x-axis and once over the y-axis. So, if I were to take this piece of the graph and mirror it over x, then I would get um, this portion and this portion mirroring it. So we flip it over the x-axis, and then we're going to flip it over the y-axis, and we get a mirror on the other side. Um, one other thing that you could be looking for with origin symmetry is these opposite quadrants. So you can see, in, this is quadrant 2, and this is quadrant 4. Those are where we have the graph matching up with each other, mirroring each other. So this 
function is an odd function and it has origin symmetry. This one last thing uh, to mention here is that uh, we don't use the labels of even and odd on graphs that are not functions. Um, so we want to double check that this is a function by doing that vertical line test. And every vertical line that I draw is intersecting the graph in just one place. So this is the graph of a function. And on this question, we are given this graph that's on the right-hand side. And we have two parts that we want to answer. For how many values of x is f of x equal to negative 3? And what is the value of f of 2? So let's start with part A. So in part A, first of all, we have these symbols that say f of x equals negative 3. We want to interpret those symbols first. We know that f of x is the same thing as y, so this is saying that y equals negative 3. So now let's read this again with that information. For how many values of x is y equal to negative 3? So in this graph, I want to pay attention to any ordered pairs that have a y equal to negative 3, but we want to make sure that we're not just looking at the ones that are labeled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line of y equals negative 3 to help me identify all of the places that happens on the graph. So I'm going to go to the y scale where y is equal to negative 3 and I'm going to draw a horizontal line at that value and that horizontal line represents all of the ordered pairs that have a y coordinate of negative 3. And then we're going to look on the graph to see how many, remember the question here says how many values of x we have with that y equal negative 3. So we notice this first one, which is a little bit unusual, and it's got an open circle. And an open circle on the graph is not included in the graph. So this point is not one of the points on the graph. Then we have this point here, which is not labeled, but it does have a y coordinate of negative 3. So we would include that as one of our points. And then we have this point here, which is labeled, I think. That's labeled as negative 1, negative 3. That has a y coordinate of 3 as well. So that's our second point on the graph that has a y-coordinate of negative 3. So when we say for how many values of x, we're going to say two values of x are where f of x is equal to negative 3. But then on the second part, it says what value excuse me, what is the value of f of 2? We want to interpret those symbols as well. So when we have those symbols f of 2, whatever's inside the parentheses is going to be our x value. And f of that number is going to be our y. So for this question, we're looking for an ordered pair that has an x of 2, and we want to figure out what that y coordinate is. So on the graph, I'm now going to draw a vertical line at x equals 2. So here's where x equals 2, and I'll draw a vertical line. And right here, we have an intersection point to that line. That ordered pair would be 2, negative 1. And so that means that f of 2 is equal to that y value of negative 1. So the value of f of 2 is negative 1.
All right, so here's another question. Classify the given function as a polynomial function, a rational function, or a root function, and then find the domain. Write the domain in interval notation. Now, the function that we're working with is g of x equals the sixth root of 7 minus x. So we're supposed to classify it as one of these different types. I didn't pull up the formal definition for these, but let's quickly go through what you would look for to categorize something in these three categories. So for polynomial, uh, let's do that one last. For rational, what you're looking for in general, now, like I said, this is a, there's a very technical definition, but really what you're looking for is if you have a variable in the denominator, that's when we would categorize something as rational. When something is a root, we would look for a radical and having a variable underneath a radical somewhere. And that radical could have any index. And then polynomial, these are the ones that all follow the certain pattern of having your terms the ax to the n and the power n, the exponent, needs to be a whole number, it needs to be 0, 1, 2, 3, these nice numbers. So on this example, we can see pretty easily that we have a radical and we have a variable underneath the radical. So we're going to categorize this as a root function. But we also want to be able to find the domain of this root function. So when you're looking for the domain of a root function, you need to pay attention to the index. The index of the radical is that n that I wrote here. So for this example, we have an index of 6. And what you pay attention to with that index is whether the index is an even number or if it's an odd number. Now, if it's an odd number, we don't have any restrictions. However, if it's an even index, we do have restrictions. So what does it mean to have no restrictions? When you have no restrictions, your domain will be all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. But we have an even index. 6 is an even number, so we do have some restrictions. Let's talk about what those restrictions are. When you have an even index on a radical, the restrictions involve negative numbers. For example, the square root of negative 1 is defined to be i, and i is the imaginary unit, um, an imaginary number which is not real. It's called a complex number. When we're finding the domain, we're concerned with only x's that are real numbers. Excuse me, I'm, I'm saying that right. I'm saying that wrong. We're only concerned with x's that are real numbers, but the y's need to also be real numbers. So this is a case here where if I take the square root of a negative, my y part is not a real number. It's imaginary or complex. So we would not want to include that negative number in our domain. And this happens, this restriction happens with the square root of every negative number and also the even index of any negative number. So when we have n being even, the nth root of x is only going to be defined when x is greater than or equal to 0.
Okay, so now that I've done all the explaining, let's go back to our problem and interpret what that means. We have g of x equals the sixth root of 7 minus x. Because we have an even index root, the expression underneath the radical needs to be greater than or equal to zero. Like I said here, greater than or equal to zero. This is an inequality and we'll solve that inequality. Subtracting seven on both sides, negative x is greater than or equal to negative seven. And I'm gonna divide by negative one on both sides. With inequalities, when you divide by a negative one, you have to reverse your inequality symbol. So we get x is less than or equal to seven. So on a number line, seven would be included and all the numbers less than seven would be included. To write this in interval notation, this interval starts at negative infinity and ends at seven. And we're gonna use a bracket because bracket means that seven is included in the set. So the domain of this root function is negative infinity to seven with seven included. Write the equation in standard form for a circle with center negative nine two and tangent to the x-axis. So let's go first over what standard form of a circle is. So standard form of a circle is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. And hk is the center of the circle and r is the radius of the circle. And I'm noticing that we are given the center, so we're gonna be given our h to be negative nine and our k to be two, so we're gonna be able to fill in the h and the k in our standard form. However, we do not have our radius at the moment. So I'm hoping this other information about being tangent to the x-axis will lead me to finding the radius of our circle because then we'll be able to write that standard form. So let's talk about what being tangent to the x-axis is. So for a circle to be tangent to the x-axis, that means that the circle will touch the x-axis. Okay, so let's draw a picture of this. And I'm not gonna draw it to scale. Um, I'm just gonna draw a sample. So if I have a circle that is tangent to the x-axis, that circle will touch the x-axis at one point. So it will touch at some point. Now what that does for us is it does lead us with a couple of leaps to be able to get to the radius of our circle. So you know that circle is going to have a center which is gonna be an ordered pair HK. And that H is the X coordinate. So the distance from here to here is h and the k is a y coordinate so the distance from here to here will be k so the reason why that's helpful is because the radius is defined to be the distance from the center to any point on the circle so remember this point right here is on the circle and it touches the x-axis. So this distance will match this distance of k here. 
So we're going to be able to use the K from our ordered pair from our center to tell us what the radius is. So our radius will equal 2. Now I want to show you one more picture before I leave this because um, I left out a little bit of detail there. What if the circle was underneath the axis, the x-axis? Because it's tangent, it would still touch at one point. This ordered pair would be hk. And now this y value is a negative number. And the distance is going to be... Um, I should write this uh, a little bit better. This y value will be a negative number, so that distance is not going to just be k. It's going to be the absolute value of k. Um, so it didn't matter in our question here, but really that distance should be the absolute value of k. So we have the center. We have the radius. Now we can write the standard form. So that's x minus h, h is negative 9 squared, plus y minus k, k is 2 squared, equals the radius squared, the radius is equal to 2, so 2 squared. So we can write that standard form as x plus 9 squared plus y minus 2 squared equals 4. So we have that standard form of the circle. Thank you for checking out my videos. Have a great day.